Hi, my name is Mike. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, thank you, Stephen, for inviting me and everybody who does service at this group. Um, my uh, sobriety date is May 23rd of 1998. And um, I have a home group and I currently, uh, it's a Zoom online men's group and meets every day. And it's called the Six Continents men's group. And it has literally 25 to 30 guys from six continents around the world, different time zones, uh, meeting every day. And it's become my home group. And I have sponsors and I sponsor guys. And um, I, I'll tell very briefly how, uh, Stephen, I've been getting, I don't even know how I got these the uh, ponderables uh, email, but I've been getting it for years. And then the um, speakers started coming. And uh, in 2017, I just kind of sold everything in my life and went on a journey to ride a motorcycle around the world. And um, I go to very, I've done about 100,000 miles in 33 countries. And, um, and I was in, I'll, I'll turn off my video for one second and you can look at my picture. And, and this is where I was the day I kind of uh, felt inspired to um, write Stephen an email because um, I, I uh, that that picture is in that's the Caucasus Mountains that separate Chechnya, Georgia, uh, Russia, and uh, Georgia, uh, not the state, the country. And um, uh, and I was uh, in this very remote place, and and I like to listen to music or speakers uh, speaker tapes. And Stephen started sending things out, so I started downloading them and putting them in my phone. And uh, that day I was, uh, uh, I listened to Stephen L from Nashville, Tennessee. I don't know if he was here, he was very inspiring. And at the end of the day, I just felt this wave of gratitude, like, um, wow, how can I be connected to all these people I've never met? And I really felt uh, in my prayer and meditation to write Stephen a thank you note and let him know how far and wide his service goes, you know, because here I am in the middle of nowhere, and I'm having a gay meeting, and so I just felt inspired thank him for his service, and, and let me hear. He said, oh, I'd like to have you come, but I had no Wi-Fi, and he said, I said, uh, you know, uh, give me a few weeks notice. And then like now a year and a half later, he invited me. So here I am. And um, uh, as I said, I'm, uh, I grew up in Connecticut, in uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, a nice little town in the suburbs of New York City and a nice family, uh, parents and a brother and sister. And my parents were very hardworking, blue collar people. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I would say my dad is this Irish guy that came home every day and uh, he uh, worked really hard. He'd come home, he'd have a, a shot of whiskey and a beer. And then he would uh, do chores around the house, the garden, then have dinner, sit down in the evening after he cleaned up, have another shot of whiskey and a beer. And that's it, you go to bed. And, and I could see just clearly now very clearly, like it, it, the difference between my dad and myself is he could control and enjoy his drinking. And if you gave me a shot of whiskey and a beer, I'm not going to do the chores. Um, I'm probably not going to have dinner and I'm going to have more whiskey and more beer. And I don't know where that's going. And uh, I definitely suffer from this phenomenon, phenomenon of craving. And, um, you know, from a young age, uh, I don't remember my first beer. On the weekends, my parents would play cards and have their friends over and sing and dance and drinking just looked like fun. And us kids were around, we'd steal a beer. I think the parents looked the other way. So I don't even remember my first drink, but it was quite young. And, um, and um, yeah, I was off. From the very beginning, I uh, had that obsession and by the time I was a senior in high school, I was in trouble. I, uh, had, I, I was 17, I was just arrested. I was having blackouts every weekend. Um, and it was, I knew I was in trouble. And um, so I got an idea, I think I need discipline. 
something like that. So I, I went to the Navy recruiter and I, I joined the Navy and uh, I came home with the papers. I didn't talk to my dad or my mom. I just went. I was only 17. I joined the delayed entry program. Basically, I turned June 7th, I turned 18. July 11th, I was in the Navy. I just graduated high school. I was barely 18. I was just a kid. And, um, you know, I, I qualified and went to some very good schools. I was in the middle of school a few months in and, and my mom died very suddenly. And, um, and that was the first big emotional thing in my life that I just did not have the uh, I didn't know how to handle that. And basically, I just did it with alcohol. I'd go out every night and drink and black out. And, and I started falling behind in school and everything. I mean, basically, I did my four years in the Navy. I got honorably discharged. During this time, my drinking escalated. I was rebellious for a time, but then I realized <laughs> they're not going to send me home. So, um, in I was a uh, stationed in Alabama for a short time. Uh, ship was in dry dock, and I got an arrest there. Uh, later, I went out to uh, California and had an arrest out there. All alcohol and drug related arrests, and nothing serious. But everywhere I went it was trouble. And um, and uh, as I said, I did my four years. I got out. Uh, I went back to Connecticut. I went to. I had a friend ask me to volunteer uh, at, the, at, at one of these telethons they used to have to, for public television. And I, I kind of went and I got that bug for TV work. And I was a big sports fan growing up. And, and you know, there's enough people on here that are old enough to uh, remember ABC's Wide World of Sports. And that was before ESPN and all that. And, and I used to watch that on the weekends and think somebody's getting paid to be there. And that's my, that's what I want to do. That's my dream. And um, so I went to school for TV production and started in on life. And, it, and it, it, it was fun for some years, I have to say. It was a lot of drinking. Every once in a while, something would go really wrong. I might have another arrest, but I, um, I don't know. It was, I was functioning. And I was in my late 20s and, and I saw people uh, getting married having kids, buying houses, buying cars. And I was still sitting on the same stinky dive bar stool that I was, you know, 10 years before or eight years before, or whatever. And, and I just couldn't figure out how these people were, have, had the money to buy houses and cars and things. And I, I had a good job, but I spent all my money drinking. And, uh, and um, I lived with a woman at this time and, and I loved her and, and I think, like I said, everybody was getting married, all of our friends in our late twenties, around 30. And, uh, and I think she was just looking at me waiting and waiting. And the thing is, I was honest with myself and not like in the book, it says, you know, if you ask the alcoholic why he went on that last spree, every once in a while, he's honest. And he, he, he has no idea, any, any more idea than you do why he, why you took it, something like that. I'm not very good at quoting the book. The ideas are embedded because they're my experience. And, and I was honest, like she would say, why, why did you want to come home? I thought you loved me. Uh, like you said, you're getting off work. It's Tuesday, you're going to go have a beer. And, and now it's like two in the morning. What, what happened? Why didn't you want to come home? And I would say, I don't know. I really don't know. I love drinking. But eventually she gave me the ultimatum, you know, uh, get it together or there's the door. I took the door. I, I knew I, if we got married, she'd want to have a kid. And I was incapable of being a father. I was incapable of being a husband. And uh, I was honest enough with myself to know I couldn't do it. And maybe selfish, self-centered to the extreme had something to do with it because I, I, I knew I couldn't show up and I didn't want to. And, uh, so uh, basically when our relationship ended, uh, that's when um, uh, my drinking and drug use took a very dark turn. And I know this is AA and I'm a big proponent of the singleness of purpose, but I have to mention very briefly uh, drugs that, you know, this was the eighties for years and years I was doing cocaine. 
I watched an HBO special about crack, and I swore I'm never going to do that. Oh, my God. You know, that looks very addictive. And one night I was very drunk. Somebody offered it to me. I tried it. I thought in a very dark way. Um, and um, I used to go to these very dangerous places uh, to buy it. And uh, one night I was very drunk and I was beaten really badly. And I had a, uh, I had a broken collarbone and black eyes. And I remember laying on the ground while these people were kicking me and punching me and robbing me and saying, God, please don't let me die here. And some guy came and uh, said, uh, you're gonna kill him, uh, let him up. And, and he helped me out of there. And uh, later, my sponsor and I were reading the big book and uh, there's a story of a jaywalker. Many of you probably have read it. It, it, it goes on and on about a person that uh, goes in the hospital, gets hit by a car, kind of the day he gets out, he can't get the idea out of his head and he runs in front of a bus. Well. My sponsor's reading this to me and we're reading it together in the book. And what went off in my head was, oh my God, I, I took this beating. Within a few days, I was in that very same place again, drunk again. And, uh, and, and that's what came to my mind when we read the Jay Walker story. So I'm so glad it's in the book. And it says, you might think our example too ridiculous, but replace alcohol with jaywalking. And I was like, oh my God, no, that's not too ridiculous. That's like who I am. That's who I've been for years. Um, a few, uh, not long after this beating, I had a friend, he was before cell phones. So we just met at the bar. He didn't really call people. He just met at the bar. He knew everybody was gonna be there. He was a good drinking buddy of mine and um, he disappeared. I'm not sure uh, where he went, but we didn't think much of it. And, um, and I guess, his brother had 10 years in AA and he, his brother started taking him to AA. So he heard what happened to me, this beating. And he, when I came home one day, they, they were there and they kind of ambushed me. And they said like, you're effed up and you're coming with us. And they took me to my first meeting. And I went angry, reluctantly. Um, and it was crowded. I remember it was like at 5.30 in the afternoon, evening. And it was people after work and it was very crowded. There were no seats. I had to stand in the back with my sling. I listened. And then when we left, I would walk across the parking lot and, and I said, uh, they, I said uh, uh, they said, you know, what'd you think of the meeting? And I said, well, those people have personal problems and why would they go in public and talk about it? And I was embarrassed for them that these personal things that they were sharing, I, I, I mean, to put it, uh, you know, just say that there was no magic in my first meeting or my first hundred meetings. I, I, uh, you know, I love to hear stories when people went to their first meeting and stayed sober. I didn't. And I was argumentative. I was obstinate. I loved drinking. I didn't want to stop drinking. I saw it was killing me. I was in that place. And, and, um, you know, uh, but I was also at the point where I was missing a lot of work. And uh, I was afraid I was going to lose my job that I had had for many years. And, um, and uh, my supervisor, Joe, was an alcoholic that the company made go to rehab. And I called Joe and I said, Joe, I, I don't know where they sent you, but I think I need to go. And he came and picked me up and uh, I went to my first rehab. And I, uh, well, to put it simply, when they told me I had to stop doing uh, drinking, I wanted to stop doing drugs. I wanted them to tell me how to do that. And then I could go back to my life of drinking. I love drinking. And when they tell you, you got to stop everything, I stopped listening. And when they said, you know, go to meetings, go get out of here, get a sponsor, get a home group. I, uh, I went to a few meetings. I got very angry. I argued with everything people were saying in my head. And then I I'd go back out drinking. And this started a cycle of the next like four years in and out of rehabs hospitals, detoxes, jails, really dark, dark places. I was evicted uh, two times. Uh, so there were brief periods of homelessness. I lived in a car, I lived in crack houses. It was, it was dark, very dark. And I had lost everything, everything. At one time I was evicted, everything I owned was thrown in a dumpster. Um, so, uh, you know, another time I was in one of these places, 
in the middle of the night, very drunk. And uh, I don't know what happened, but the next thing I knew, I got my head bashed in really badly. And my face was swollen really bad. And I was bleeding. And I didn't go to the doctor. I didn't go to the hospital. I just thought, uh, well, it's going to be over soon. And that will be okay with me. And, um, and I just say, God had another plan. And, um, uh, uh, but after about a month of just coming to, and I was in that horrible place where I couldn't drink, I couldn't quit and I couldn't die. I just, just wanted it to be over. And, uh, and, uh, so I wasn't a, a heroin user, but I bought a bunch of it. I thought, I'm just going to do all this and I'm going to kill myself and I'm going to drink this bottle of vodka. And that morning I was driving somewhere to go park to do that. And I met angel number one. I pulled into a rest area and there was a woman there and she came right over to my car and she said, I need a ride. And I said, okay, get in. And I said, uh, and this is very strange. It was like a Tuesday morning at nine o'clock or something like that. And, um, and uh, she, I asked her if she drank and she said, yes. And I said, do you get high? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I have all this stuff. And she said, well, let's get a hotel room. And I said, oh, okay. And my plan for that day changed and uh, we went to a hotel and that morning she was identical to me. She had been in a detox, was supposed to go to rehab. She escaped and then where God brought us together. And we went to a hotel room for two days and, and we laughed and we cried and got high. And, and in the end, one alcoholic to another, we gave each other hope. And I, I dropped her at a detox and I went to another one. There I met the second angel and she uh, made all these arrangements for me to go to this uh, rehab. And, and it's a place in, uh, in the hills of Connecticut called High Watch Farm. It was started in 1939 by Bill Wilson, and Marty Mann. And it's this spiritual place in the hills there. Uh, I went there and when I got there, I don't know what happened, but uh, there was a guy there that was the director of the place and he was passionate about the big book and the program of action contained the spiritual program of action. He was reading this book in these study groups and I, it was like, it was like I was hearing it for the first time and I'm sure I'd heard it before, but it was like, it was just all making sense. And he talked about there are chronic hopeless variety of alcoholic and you have two choices, go on to the bitter end, uh, or accept spiritual help. And it was just like, okay, I've tried everything. And this seems like the last stop. And um, they had a program there where you could uh, stay long-term and, uh, and I signed up and they accepted me. And now it had been two months since I was hit in the head and, um, and it still was painful. And my eye was still purple and discolored and, um, and I, my vision wasn't good. And so I said, can I go to a hospital? Can I get a doctor or something? And they x-rayed my skull. And the doctor was very put off. And he said, you have a severely fractured skull. And he said, left untreated. I've never seen anything like this. We usually have to drill a hole in your head to relieve the pressure. You know, there's fluids going in and out of your brain cavity. You should have gotten a brain infection and died. He said, I'm astounded that you're sitting here. You should thank God you're alive. And I uh, went to an eye doctor and he said, your eye was crushed and it's, there's, there's a rip, a tear and uh, it's healing, but I can't see you. I can't explain why you can see. Um, I went back to the farm. I sat on the edge of the bed. I was astounded. And um, I had one of those profound spiritual experiences where I felt uh, a presence, a warmth, a peace, and a love came all around me, in me, through me. It was like God embraced me, and it was just a feeling that um, the war is over. And I knew I was in the hand of God in that moment. And there's no explaining this when it happens. It's just, it's profound. And it's like, and I was stunned. And I went to this guy, Fred, who I'd been listening to now for a month. And, and, and during this time, I had been listening also to Joe and Charlie tapes. And they were making complete sense to me. And I went to Fred, I told him what had happened. And, and after I had that experience, still sitting on the bed, the next thought very strongly came to me, uh, get with this guy and get to work. And that's what I did. And I realized that I came to that place filled with hatred and anger, guilt, shame, remorse, fearful, 
And, um, and that if I could get free of that stuff, I could get free of the drink. And that's, that's what the 12 steps are about is to dig deep down and get free of that shit. Let the light in, let God in. And I mean, God is there, but just all the blockages need to go. And so I got there, I stayed there for quite some time, uh, three or four months. And Fred took me, um, and I would say this, uh, it, in the, that was my second step, that spiritual experience. The third step, you know, I thought when you sit and look at it on paper, turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. That sounds pretty heavy, pretty big. And, uh, but when you read the big book, what does it talk about? It doesn't talk a lot about God. It talks a lot about me. And I am uh, selfish and self-centered. And page 62, I think it used the word self or some form of self 11 times. Self-pity, self-deceiving, um, selfish, self-centered um, in the extreme. And, and then it talks about me being the director and trying to direct everybody's show. And, uh, and when you know, things don't go well, I try harder and push harder. And, and, and so for three or so pages, it talks about me and my attitude and the way I've been treating everybody in the world. And, um, and you know, it's the futility of life, the way I've been living it. Am I willing to change and try something different, a new director? And yes, I was absolutely on board and I wanted to save my life. And I said, Fred, I'm willing to turn my will and life over to the care of God, you, that book whatever, just tell me what to do. No more suggestions, but because for years, people gave me suggestions and I did what I wanted to do. And I just said, no, just tell me what to do. So we got to work, as I said, and I wrote it the most honest, fearless thing I had done in a really long time, that fourth step, and I shared it with Fred. And for me, all those years of meetings that I felt a disconnect from everybody, and I would sit there with an attitude and just say, I don't want to hear their problems. I have my own, you know, I have lots of my own. And after doing a fifth step, something changed. God changed and doing a sixth and seventh step, doing that prayer. And I really like the timeline where it says you write, you read your fifth step, then you sit for an hour, you contemplate the work you've done and you, uh, you, you ask God to remove that. And, you know, I really think that that timeline is just right. You go to meetings and six and seven meetings and people will talk about, well, there's not much in the book and I don't know. Um, I think it's perfect because I've just read this fifth step. I just poured my heart out about how difficult and how messed up I am and how I treated people. And, and I was ashamed and I felt um, like, yes, I, this is not who I am. I don't want to be this person. I'm ready to go to God right now. Please take this. I don't want to be this person. But if you give me a couple of weeks after I've done that fifth step, I will forget who I am. I will forget all the things I wrote. Slowly, I will think it wasn't that bad. I wasn't that bad. So um, yes. And then, you know, basically, uh, I'm trying to watch my time so I don't get talk too long but, uh, about this because I like to get to life you know uh it's been 25 years and there's a lot to talk about but basically uh uh my time was up fred got me to the eighth step my time was up and um i didn't know where i was going to go my family at one point had did this heartbreaking intervention on me and they all cried and it was uh as the book says frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices and it was frothy and it was emotional and and they all went around the table and told me how much they loved me and um, that they, they couldn't stand to see me dying the way I was dying. And after that, I just disappeared for a couple of years. They didn't know I was out in the streets somewhere and they didn't know where I was and I hid from them. And my dad, he, he, his father, my grandfather, uh, died when my dad was 15 of cirrhosis. He drank himself to death. And my dad's brother, uh, when he died a few years ago, he had 44 years of sobriety. At this time, he probably had about uh, 20 or 30, I don't know. And he, um, he was advising my dad. And you know, after they did that invent intervention, sent me to rehab and I drank again shortly after that, uh, you know, uh, my uncle said, you have now shut him out and you pray for him and that's all you can do. And um, so, uh, you know, but 
I was in this place, I had this experience, but I had had a few months before and, and my family all were still very leery of me and they, they um, you know, um, they were like, okay, glad to hear you're doing good, hang up, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, I had nowhere to go. I had an uninsured, unregistered car that I had been living in. I had some dirty clothes and I had nowhere to go. And there was a guy I had met in a rehab a year earlier who had tried to help me many times. And he lived in, uh, in uh, Bonita Springs, Florida, near Naples. And I called him and I said, John, I, I can't believe it, but something's happened to me. And, um, and long story short, him and his wife sent me money and said, come to Florida, we will help you. We will get you an apartment. We will, they took me to Goodwill. They bought me a bed. They get me a roommate. Uh, they gave me a job. I mean, they saved my life and took me 1,200 miles from Connecticut to Florida, away from where I, I had been going through all this and relapsing and knew so many people. And they brought me to Florida. And uh, and there I uh, uh, I met my second sponsor. Maybe there's some people here who might know this guy. He was kind of very well-known, uh, Larry Bach in, in Naples, Florida. And he they would love him or hate him. There are a lot of people. He helped a lot of people and he helped me because he introduced me to the other parts. Fred gave me the steps, the, the program. But uh, Larry introduced me to the fellowship and to service. And, um, you know, he told me the schedule of meetings that we're going to every day. We'd start at eight o'clock at the 24 hour club in Naples and then we'd do another meeting in the evening. But he had a little uh, shop where it was like a clubhouse itself. And I hung out there with him a lot. But anyway, I worked really hard. I got a job in a TV station and I started to work in TV again. Uh, and, um, and I did service, you know, Larry would call me and say, we're going in the hospital. There's a drunk up there. The doctor called me and I'd say, I got nothing to say. He goes, no, don't say anything. Just come. And we go. And it was like, oh, powerful. And, um, and I got a commitment at a soup kitchen and I help people there. And, um, and um, yeah, it just like, you know, I just felt complete that, 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 that uh, I was in the program and, and I was sober and I was loving it. And, and also I started in on amends and, uh, you know, for years, my dad, uh, my stepmother later told me that your dad didn't sleep for years thinking he was going to get that call one night. And so I said to Larry, how can I ever make amends to this? And he said, you know, you, you, uh, you, uh, yeah. He said, when was the last time you talked to him? And I said, I don't know, a month ago. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, you have to call him every week and you ask him what's going on in his life. Tell him what's happening in yours. Tell him you love him. And so I did that. I did that for two years before he, he died. And, um, and he knew I was okay. And he knew something had happened to me. And, um, and, um, I kind of want to speed things up because I'm running. Uh, I always talk too long. But uh, anyway, um, uh, after uh, working in that little TV station in Florida, I met an engineer and he was building a television truck and he asked me to help him. And he taught me from very scratch, we built a television truck and, uh, and taught me how to operate it. And I, um, after two years down there, I said, I want to move back to the Northeast. And so um, I, uh, I moved back um, and um, I just put a bunch of resumes out and I wasn't really qualified, but I, uh, I, um, I, I put this one uh, resume to a place in Boston. And this guy just took me out to dinner and he says, we don't get into whole HR things. I just want to sit and have a dinner with you and talk. And we talked a few hours and he said, you know what? You're not, you don't have all the experience that we need, but I like you. I think you're the right kind of person. He, he took me on the road with him and he was working for ESPN. And for three months, we started doing sports TV at, at very high level college, professional sports. And, and after three years, months on the road, they gave me my own truck. And, you know, I remember being in, in Heinz Field in uh, Pittsburgh uh, shortly after it opened. And, um, and, and I was set up 
and and tested out. And I remember walking out on the field. I said, I'm going on the field. It's like four or five hours before the game. And I walked out there and, and I just got this overwhelming feeling and tears just streaming down my face. And I was just like, how can you go from the crack house to here? It's only by the grace of God. And, um, and uh, it was just a, a, an amazing experience because, you know, alcohol and drugs, I had dreams when I was young and alcohol destroyed everything and destroyed families and relationships. And, and in a short time in the program, uh, just a couple of years, my life had been restored and dreams that I forgot I ever dreamed were happening. And, but the thing is, I had experienced a fellowship and I, I was on the road and I was hard to get to meetings and I missed the fellowship. I missed the thing. And I had to, my dream job had happened, but I, it was not for me. I had to leave. And um, I had always uh, had a dream to live and work in New York. And I just set a goal and I, I got there and uh, I switched over to doing news and I ended up working for one of the biggest news organizations in the world. And um, I, as soon as I got there, first thing I did was I got a home group and I got service and I started sponsoring guys. And I just wanted to be that guy that I saw in Fred with the light in his eye, confident, happy, and telling people there is a solution. I can help you. And um, so I just started sponsoring guys and doing service. And, uh, and so everywhere I've gone in the last 25 years, that is goal number one. I'm not comfortable. And I've lived a lot of places. I've lived a lot of places in the US and in the world. And everywhere I go, I just get a home group, get connected, start doing service, start sponsoring guys. It's the same thing. And, and then, you know, this, uh, I love this line that, you know, the things that come to us when we placed ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have imagined. And, you know, it, it's my experience. It's the truth. And, you know, um, in 2017, after many years living and working in New York, saving money, and, um, and I would say in this time, I never got married. Um, I met a woman at Ground Zero uh, when the towers fell in that terrorist attack. I met a journalist from Romania and I never would have believed in love at first sight until it happened. And, um, and she stayed for a few years, but she was so homesick and she went home to Romania and we, it ended and I never got married or had kids. It wasn't my plan, I always thought. I would, but it just didn't happen. And um, but in 2017, I had a dream, and I'm going to ride a motorcycle around the world. And I sent a motorcycle to um, from uh, I had moved from Calif uh, to New York, New York City to Monterey, California. I have a home group there. I have friends there. I lived up in Eugene, Oregon, for a year or two. I have a home group there. I have friends there. I have sponsees there. And I, um, I sent the motorcycle and me in the same plane to London, and we started riding. We rode for six months straight with some camping gear. I went to meeting. I've been to meetings, I think, in between 20 to 30 countries, whether they speak English or not. And I've had many, many amazing experiences with that. Um, and, and I actually remained friends with that, uh, that woman in Romania. And... Um, sorry. She is a lawyer and she made me a volunteer visa and I was able to stay in the EU for another year, over a year. And my visa was ending. And I said, well, I'm so close to Turkey. And if I got to go back to America, I'm going to. Um, and I, I would say also in Bucharest, Romania, I lived there for one year. There's a tiny little English speaking group there. I have friends there. Um, a guy that I'm going to see uh, probably in next week in, in Thailand, we're meeting there. Um, he, uh, and yeah, so I just uh, seek out AA, get connected, and, and then the rest of my life can fall into place. But that's got to be the most important thing and practicing these principles in all of my affairs. So anyway, um, we went, uh, I, I went to Turkey. I rode around the whole country like six weeks by myself. It's amazing, beautiful, spectacular, friendly country, no crime. It's just amazing. And I can't say enough about it. Um, and it's probably not what you think, but if you, if you think it's like the Middle East and the desert, it's not, it's, uh, there are parts of it like that, but uh, think 
where I live is like Greek islands. They're right off the coast and it's beautiful turquoise uh, with mountains right up to the sea. It's spectacular. But anyway, I rode around the whole country. I stopped on a Friday night in Istanbul and I went to the AA meeting and it was like 30 people. And, um, and, and then like 15 people went to dinner after and I sat next to this guy and he was an American and he had just moved there and he said, here's a, I can help you. There's a, it's very easy to get a resident permit and move here. And uh, I have a two bedroom place. If you wanna come, I can uh, let you stay until you find your own. And so he did. I went back to Romania, I packed up my stuff, put it on my motorcycle and went to Turkey and moved there and um, continued my travels. Uh, and then in 2020, of course, the world stopped. And I was on my way across the north uh, coast of Turkey to uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan. I was going to take a ferry to Kazakhstan and ride in T Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. I had a whole plan and then on to Mongolia. And I didn't know where I was going, but uh, I was just going to continue around the world. And um, and then the pandemic happened. I got back to Istanbul. I got an apartment and I rode it out by myself and started on Zoom. And then um, uh, I started chatting online with a woman and she was working on a big mega yacht in the uh, Mediterranean as a crew. And, and long story short, uh, um, she finished her thing after three months of chatting. And I said, I have a two bedroom place. You're more than welcome to come and stay. And if it's not for you, okay, we'll see how we go. But we've gotten along pretty well. And she came and that was three years ago. She's still there, hasn't left. And last year, I, I went to America after the pandemic and I had to get my passport renewed. And I waited like seven weeks. and. Um, and during that time, my alcoholic brain said, ah, I'm okay without her. You know, I don't need her. I don't need any, blah, blah, blah. You know, stupid alcoholic brain telling me things that are not true. And then I went back and I remember looking over at her one night at the couch and just came over me this overwhelming feeling of love and like, what the hell was I thinking? I don't want to be without her. <laughs> And so, yeah, I asked her to marry me and we've been married now for a little over a year. Um, and she's amazing. I was patient. I waited till God brought me the right person. And I remember in Oregon working with a sponsor and I was pretty angry and distressed. Like, hey man, I've been sober a really long time. How come this is not working out for me? And, um, you know, um, you know, he just said, you need to keep working on yourself and prepare yourself and work on yourself and, and God will uh, send you this gift, but you have to get ready for this gift. And so that's what I did. Just keep working on myself and continuing to take inventory, pray and meditate every day uh, and not for one day in sobriety. And there have been struggling times. I was early in sobriety, diagnosed with hepatitis C. I had to go through a horrible treatment. In 2010, I was nearly killed in a motorcycle accident. And both of those occasions, my home group people just came in and picked me up and carried me along. And, um, you know, it's always been that way for me. I just rely on the fellowship and try to give and do service. And um, let me see, I have like five minutes, Stephen, or should I, okay. I think I'll tell a, a few. Well, this one amends story. I, I, I really like this story uh, uh, because I did, I owed a lot of money. I owed thousands and thousands of dollars. And when I, Larry would tell me like that paycheck you got is not your money. Um, he said, uh, you, you are, uh, uh, you are uh, holding other people's money, every paycheck you get and be careful how you spend it. And I had for two years to pay back thousands and thousands of dollars. And um, anyway, when I moved from Florida to, uh, and my dad died, I moved up to Rhode Island. And, uh, and when my dad died, I got a box of papers and it, 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 uh, there was one in there that was a, a lawsuit um, in small claims court for $1,200. And, it was uh, one time I was evicted. Um, 
this lady had, you know, she was really kind actually. And she, she gave me so many chances and I just never could pay the rent because I'd start to drink and, and the whole paycheck was gone. And I swore I was going to pay my bills. And I spent in that place, I spent one winter without heat and hot water. And uh, I would go to the gas station and wash up. And um, I just swore I was going to pay that bill. But every time I got paid, I'd start to drink and I'd never pay the bill. And uh, eventually she told me, you have to go, you have to go, you have to go. And one day I came home, the locks were on the door and it was changed and there was a padlock. And I said, OK. And I was so afraid to go back to get my stuff because there were there was uh, I was afraid to be arrested. There was drug paraphernalia in the apartment. So anyway, I, I just let it all go. And uh, including my Navy uniform <laughs> was in a bag in there, and my one uniform and medals and things that, that I had saved. And uh, anyway, so when I got this lawsuit, I said, I called my sponsor and I said, what do I do? And he said, well, you got to go pay a lady. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I called a few times. She wasn't there. And I I, so I, it was very near where my brother lived and I was going to go visit my brother. And so I said, I'll just stop by. And I went and, and it wasn't there. And I could see in the door, there was a slot and there was the mail was on the floor. And uh, I saw the mailman coming and I said, um, um, does this lady still work here? And he said, uh, um, um, I, she picks up the mail, but I haven't seen her in a long time. And I, I left and I, I said, uh, I'm going to call my sponsor to see what to do. But he always would say, have you prayed? So I stopped on the side of the road and I prayed. And I said, what do I do? And it just came to me, go back, put your name and number in the slot and have her call you. So I go back and she was standing there. And I went up and I said, uh, oh, I don't know if you remember me, but I, uh, I showed her the lawsuit. And, uh, and then I said, I want to give you this money. I gave it she started crying and she said you know my husband is dying and I haven't been able to work I need this money so much right now and I was crying she was crying and I realized it's God you know I should have done this amen two years before but you know God sent me when she needed it and it was quite a powerful experience for me and for her she said to me what what church do you go to and I said I don't go to church, but uh, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's what did. And it was just a, uh, it just, it, and and it just made me seek out what other amends do I need to do? And it's not for me; it's for these other people. I created a lot of messes in life, and I need to uh, relieve them of the problems. And and in in the process, I get I get free, and and that's what it's all about. So. I think I've talked long enough. Um, I, I really thank you, Stephen, and I pray for your wife, Dorothy, and, and you, and I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad I could be here tonight. I, I don't usually come when I'm in Turkey because it's like three o'clock in the morning, but now I'm in the Far East. It's 9 a.m., where I started at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. <laughs>